before you stand, I'm going to have you stand in a moment, but do grab your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, and we are looking at the second installment of our study into Romans chapter 2. We started off last week with what turned out to be an introduction <laughs> to a lofty, incredible argument that the apostle is bringing forth, and he spoke in incredible clarity, in, in, in a prophetic way, by the way. A chapter one, read it later. He spoke in chapter one as though he was speaking to the 21st century of our world. Certainly as though he was speaking to Hollywood 2,000 years ago. And we were asking the question, and we still, still are asking the question, is who do you think you are? A people who may live or do or think this way. And then he turns, as it were, his holy cannon fire, and he shoots into chapter two, and he says, those of you who are nothing like those in chapter one, oh no, you, you in chapter two, you're the ones who are so refined. So white collar in your living, in religion, in religiosity, he begins to speak to them. And there's this incredible, remember church, there's this incredible massive pendulum swing from those who are living in gross sin of Romans chapter one to those who are living in the approved sins of our day and age. The respectable sins. And the Holy Spirit will have none of it. And we learned last week that the Bible teaches us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That we all need Jesus Christ. And we're living in a world and in a time where is it not obvious that the world is no longer able to prop up our desires, our, our fun, our leisure, whatever it might be. Oh, have you seen the commercials? I think Lisa and I last night saw on TV the commercial. Poor guy, he didn't get the memo. It's the beautiful voice in the man of Viking River Cruises. Have you seen that commercial? And the, the, showing all these beautiful sights. Come, he says, the world is open again. <laughs> he didn't get the memo. Um, <laughs> But we, we sat there and we said to one another, remember when that was just true? Yes. Hawaiian Airlines had a commercial and it said something to the effect, paradise is open. But they didn't get the memo. Simple things. The world is being shaken. Freedoms are being evaporated. The world is in a profound, global, unified shift. And if you and I do not see our need for Jesus, then I don't know what it's going to take for you and I to see our need for Jesus. All I know is that if California breaks off from the rest of the nation and falls into the depths of, a, of the Pacific, I know this. When I'm done treading water... I see Jesus. I see Jesus. So there's this hypocrisy of self-righteousness, and there's the blatant knowledge of sin. And before we even get into this, I want to read something to you. It's perhaps one of the most colorful moments in New Testament theology, maybe in the entire Bible. It's certainly revealing to the nature of God and you may be ministered to just with this read and get nothing else out of the rest of the day. But it's in John chapter 8, and I'll read it to you. In John chapter 8, beginning at verse 2, you'll recognize it quickly in a moment. The Bible says there that now early in the morning, he, that's Jesus, came into the temple. That's the temple precinct, the temple compound. And all the people came to him. Isn't that beautiful? Listen, everybody, if Jesus was so spooky, scary, and God is mean and ugly, then why did all the people come to him? I got a feeling wherever Jesus went, I mean this reverently, I do. I, wherever Jesus went, I think dogs ran up to him. Because have you noticed dogs know stuff? 
Have you, if, if your dog doesn't go to someone, you need to, there's something wrong with that person. Have you noticed little kids, little kids and dogs go to someone, that person's okay. If a little kid pulls away from somebody and the dog goes and puts its tail between his legs and, and gets away from the person, you better watch out. Something's up. Jesus shows up and everybody comes to him. And he sat down and he taught them, verse 3, and then the scribes and Pharisees, boy, here comes the party poopers. They brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Okay, number one, watch this. Jesus is in the temple compound area in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. It's in the morning. Everybody's there, big crowd. The religionist drag a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman who was caught in adultery in the very act, which I told you before, it must mean they were watching. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing Jesus, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. Now, the last time that happened, God was writing with his finger on Ten Commandments. As though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, by the way, the word in the Greek is they, answer us. Moses said, she's to be stoned, answer us. Answer us. Moses said, she's to be stoned, answer you know, us. You know that just, and I'm, I'm wondering if the mind of God, you just hear this. No wonder why Jesus acted like he didn't hear them. He probably just tuned them out. He raised himself up, Jesus did, and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, okay, that's weird. He was writing, but they heard it. Are you watching this? Being convicted by their conscience... Oh, now we know. He's writing in the dirt, but they hear it in their head. They went out one by one, beginning uh, with the oldest. This is so Jewish. The oldest, even to the last or the youngest. The oldest left first. Why? Because the person who lives longer has greater sin, more sin. They're, in other words, their account is more overdue than the other than the young guy. The guy, young guy hasn't lived long enough to rack up that too big of a bill, but the older guy has, and the older guy's going, yikes. Okay? And so, and the woman standing in the midst, and when Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman, and he said to her, woman, where are your accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now, that's a funny thing, isn't it? They're all condemning her. And she said, and I wonder what this sounded like, no one, Lord? And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That word is do not practice sin any longer. Don't let it rule over you anymore. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You want to know why this is amazing? They brought the woman to Jesus uh, against the law of Moses. They bring the woman to Jesus without the man. Okay? They were, their, their intention was not to enforce righteousness like some rule keepers. They were looking to set Jesus up, right? To pit him against Moses. Why did they do that? Because Moses was the stalwart of the law. He was the representative of the Ten Commandments. He was the one who issued from Mount Sinai the rules. And when you don't know God, you're all about rules. 
and they had the rules on their side, and they were going to nail Jesus, but they needed someone. And I think, personally, I'm making this part up now, why didn't they bring the man? Because the man was probably hired to entice that woman into sin. Because according to the law, there's supposed to be her and him, and according to the law, they're both to be tried and stoned to death together. But this is not what's going on. In fact, how quickly the table's turned, it's beautiful. But not only that, listen, according to the oral law of the Jews, the priest, listen to this, the priest, when someone was caught in a sin, before judgment, watch this everybody, in Judaism, the priest was to go down into the ground and write, watch this, write the person's name and the accusation against them in the dirt. Watch. And when the sentence comes, are you listening? Yes. When the sentence comes, guilty, the priest takes his hand or his foot and he wipes out from the earth your name. You're removed. Think about it. That's your name. The Bible says all those whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life, but had been blotted out. It's that picture. The name is removed and you're condemned. That's what the priest was supposed to do. They should have stooped down and written her name, her sin, his name, his sin, and issue the condemnation. But something's wrong. And do you remember here a moment I said that Jesus announces, Behold, right? I'm the light of the world. You know what's interesting about this, church? Is that this issue takes place at the temple regarding this woman. The stooping down and the writing in the earth. The oldest to the youngest of the legalists is condemned in their conscience. They hear what he writes. When we read what God writes, we should hear in our hearts and our minds. It should convict us or encourage us, bless us, strengthen us, guide us, admonish us. When we read it, we should hear it. But then Jesus follows up and says, I'm the light of the world. He says that, by the way, on the last, listen, all night long, the grand menorahs during the festival of lights at the temple had been burning. They're massive. 50 gallon, you know, each, each think of a menorah, and each of the cups, the bowls, are 50 gallons each. And inside, listen, inside, Albert Barnes, the great scholar, points out that when priests over the year would offer up sacrifices, they would take off their priestly garments, their, their, uh, their, their undergarments, because they could never be used again. They were rolled up, they were bound up, and they were stored and, and preserved for what? Why would they preserve their priestly uh, underwear that they used during the year because Albert Barnes tells us that it's the very underwear garment that was used as a wick in those containers and it burned during the festival of lights and at the end of the festival all of the lights are extinguished by the way they're huge and they just lit up the temple mount we're talking huge candelabras as it were and they had just extinguished them, and then Jesus, he, no doubt he waited till they put out the lights. And Jesus says, I wish, oh, I want to see this. Jesus must have motioned toward those candelabras at the Temple Mount. He must have pointed to them and said, I am the light of the world. Every Jew would have went, oy vey. The light went out, but he is something more than the light that just went out. 
This is the one who writes. Now listen to this. What was going on? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. Remember the woman caught in the act of adultery. Remember what the scribes and Pharisees are doing, writing in the dirt. They should have. Jesus assumes the role of being the priest that he is. He's the one who writes in the dirt, but he doesn't write anything about the woman. He writes about them the religionist, the self-righteous, I'm better than you, individual who thinks they're great with God and all is well. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. The word is also translated embarrassed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters. Did not Jesus also pronounce that he was the fountain of living waters? Do you see what's going on here? When God sees, he sees all. He sees the lost, lonely person consumed in sin and he sees the man who is deceived and wrapped in his self-righteousness and God sees them equally lost. And we need Christ. One more. John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. That's the water. And he who believes in me, as the, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's the light of the world. He's the living water. He's the one that writes in the earth. He's the one that knows. We hear that in our conscience. And we should hear God speaking to us today in this. So church, let's rise. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. We'll read it together. I'll begin in verse 1. And you can pick it up in the even numbered verses. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Eternal life to those who by patient endurance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality, no favorites, no, no special kids with God. Amen. Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And so, church, diving back into this, we're asking that question, who do you think you are? And that's a statement that goes out, of course, to every one of us. There's a, uh, there's a, a, a landing point with this eventually. We'll get there in a few weeks, I trust, to where when we talk about who do you think you are, it actually ends on the positive note like this, where after we farm this field and break up the soil... Uh, that there are those that are unrighteous and blatantly so by their deeds. There are those that are unrighteous that are not so easily seen because they're draped in this cloak of self-righteousness that eventually we land in answering the question, who do you think you are? Here's, Here's the answer to all of you who are believers today. Who do you think you are? You and I should know exactly who we are. We are children of the living God. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
Our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. God has declared us righteous based upon his son's sacrifice at the cross. Jesus rose again from the dead. We believe that. And in doing so, Jesus is our mediator. He's our representation. That we don't represent ourselves before God. No, we have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he's the one that stands, the Bible tells us, that he forever lives to make intercession for us who believe, that right now in heaven, the Bible says that God is speaking to his father in favor of you, not condemning you. The Bible says Satan is the one who's condemning us, that Satan is the one who's accusing us, but God in Christ Jesus is the one who is saying, Father, these are my children. Father, these are they, my brethren. These are the ones. And you remember, I think we talked about it on Wednesday night. Father, these are the ones who are hidden in my hand and are in your hand so that you are like a salvation sandwich, man. You are right, you're in the hands of Jesus and the Father's hands over you. You are like a burrito. I'm a Jack burrito. You're, you may be a Bob burrito or a Kathy burrito. But we are, we are, Ephesians says that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit into the day of redemption. And this is the believer. Who do you think you are? I'm one of those. I'm, I'm one of his. And you either know that or you do not know that. If you do not know that, then you are either choosing to live in gross sin or you have wrapped yourself in self-righteousness. And you look down the long nose of yourself of pride, and you point and you find the faults and sins of others, and that's what you do. And uh, the Bible here just told us you ought not to do that. And so we're looking at the fact that in verses 1 and 2, that who do you think you are compared to the righteousness of God? And we see this now in our study as we look at it in relation to his law. Uh, are we, listen, are we, are you, do we live before God, uh, before his law? And if you do that, if you look into the perfect law, I'm talking about God's law, you predominantly talk about the Old Testament, which is holy, pure, and just. It just can't save you, but it's holy nonetheless. The Old Testament reveals the righteousness of God. That's what the Ten Commandments does. That's why, by the way, nobody wants to post the Ten Commandments in our nation's uh, facilities or in, in our state facilities, our schools. Listen, the reason why, it's not, a, it's not a political issue, it's a spiritual issue. It's just that the politicians say, you can't put the Ten Commandments in a classroom. Even though it is probably the single most greatest and most famous bit of human history, you can't put it in there. Why? Because it makes us uncomfortable. Well, it would only make you uncomfortable if you're guilty of things on the list. And that's exactly what it was given for. But we can't have that. But it doesn't negate God's law. Verse 1 says, therefore, you are inexcusable. There's no excuse, O man, whoever you are who judge. This is interesting. Watch this. For in what you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. I want you to make a note, write this, everybody. Don't, don't uh, confuse this. Are you listening? Yes. Everybody? Yes. Did I scare you off earlier in the announcements? Are you there? I need you to come back. Come back. Come on back. Here's the thing. According to the scripture, we are commanded, even by Jesus himself, to judge. Did you know that? No, listen. It's true. You say, oh, but I thought you, we're not supposed to judge. We are victims of the English language, okay? We don't, our, words, we, our words don't have the, the uh, technicolor as the Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic has. When the Bible here says that when you look to somebody and you say, oh my goodness, you should never cheat on your income tax, and then you cheat on yours, okay, that's wrong, this is what the Bible's talking about, if you're living in a certain 
sin and you have come, well, listen, in your righteousness, you have so mitigated it and you've so taken sandpaper and taken up the rough edges that people who do that are terrible people. But yours is different. You are not to do that. This is the judgment that you are not to do. But when I say that we are commanded to judge, listen, didn't Paul the apostle in Romans chapter 1 judge all those who are living aberrant lifestyles? The answer is yes. Didn't Jesus say, by their fruits, you'll know them? What was he saying? Watch someone's life. Okay, listen up. Ushers, lock the doors. This is what Jesus is saying, and James said the same thing. You can really, really know who or what a person really is, not by what they say they are, but watch them. And then you can conclude by judgment, you come to a decision, there's nothing about their life that's Christian. Do you see? This is very important. If we go no further today, this is what the Bible's teaching. Nobody is a follower of Jesus Christ by word only, by declaration only. I'm a Christian. I've told you before, when somebody says, I am a highly full-blown atheist, I don't believe in God. I have to tell you, when I talk to such people, I'm relaxed. You want to know why? If they say, I just robbed a bank, I just did this or that, I'm okay with them. I don't expect anything else from them. Now, don't write me a letter and say, I, Pastor, you're so mean, I'm an atheist, and I've never robbed a bank. Oh, listen, no kidding. But you get the point. If you're an atheist, you have no standard. There's no bar to live up to. You can, there's no God to answer to. You can do whatever you want. It's, it's, it's the survival of the fittest. So you're cool. I'm cool with you. I, I, I'm not going to be surprised by anything you do. But the moment somebody comes along and says, I'm a Christian. Oh, boy. Here we go. Do you see where I'm going with this? Now i got to watch you. If I say the same thing to you, look, if I meet you somewhere and, I, and you ask me a question, I say, I'm a Christian. You should say, oh boy, now I got to watch you to see if it's true. You made a huge claim. <laughs> Big claim there. You declared to be a follower of Jesus, obedient to the Lord Jesus. He's your Lord. So now I got to watch you for the next 30 days. That's what James, that's what the book of James is all about. James, the book of James basically says to the believer, I've got to move into your house. I've got to sit there. I've got to watch you for 30 days and listen to you. See how you, talk, see how you treat your husband. See how you treat your wife, your kids. See how, you, see how you conduct yourself in your singleness. At the end of 30 days, I, me, James, will tell you if you're a Christian or not. Powerful, Right? It's the world around us that can tell us if we're Christians or not. If people hate us, and people hate us, do they hate us because we're mean, rude, and ugly? Or do they hate us because of what we stand for, because what we stand for glorifies God? Big difference. None of us should be ugly or rude. But when we say, this is what I stand for because God's word says this, It's altogether different. So when you condemn and when you judge, that's what you're doing. When you are doing the same things that you are saying people ought not to do, Paul is saying that you're in deep trouble. So the word therefore here means this, that this is the reason. You can write that down in your margins of your Bible. Therefore, in verse 1, this is the reason. This is the reason why you are inexcusable, O man. And you... Paul now begins to give you this list. It's like when the doctor says to you, this is going to be a little uncomfortable. It means it's going to hurt like the, like the dickens. It's, well, Paul is saying, okay, therefore, it's like, okay, hang on. Here it comes. You are inexcusable, O oh man. You who judge, the word judge here means to decide a final 
decision. See, the Christian is to never do that. You and I do not have the authority to issue a final decision on someone's life. In your mind, think of the worst sinner you know in life. Now, that's it's a kind of a funny thing because if I, for me, if you think of the worst sinner, like, oh, Adolf Hitler, or oh, wait a minute, the worst sinner in my life is me. Paul the Apostle said the worst sinner in his life was himself. Why? Because it becomes very personal. Look, walk with Jesus and you don't point at other people in a condemning way. Walk with Jesus and you realize that at any moment he could point to you. So when you walk with him, you will notice that the people who are walking close to Jesus are gracious people. I don't mean they're passive in the face of wrong. Please hear me out. This is almost impossible for me to communicate, not because the Bible's not true. It's because I I don't have the brain capacity to convey it. When, When I see something wrong in someone's life, I better check my life first before I say anything to them. And then when I go to them, I should go to them alone and say, it breaks my heart to say this, but, and then you say it, humbly, ladies and gentlemen, church family, God help us. There's a grosser sin than that individual that we commit when we Text someone else about it. Hey, you know what? I just, I just saw, I just caught uh, Fred in an act of adultery with a woman. Where should we bring, should we stone them? What do you say? You just committed a sin bigger than that sin. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, hi, you guys, I know, let's, get, let's gather together and pray. Did you hear about what happened to Sonso? No. Uh, well, let's, let's pray. Oh, God, you know that that guy who was over there and he was wearing that red shirt and his name is, do you know that sin? I mean, that prayer instantly becomes a sin. You're gossiping before the throne of God. You're, that's what the Bible says, a tale bearer. And God says, I hate that. No, no, you keep quiet. And you go to them alone. But if it ever there's this glee about, I'm going to call them out. You are here in Romans chapter 2. You're inexcusable, oh man. The body of Christ should be humble, loving, listen, tender, but to the point with truth. We are to never glaze over. We are to never say, well, you know what? You're living in, you're, you're committing a fornication or adultery, but you're in the choir Oh, we'll just overlook that. You know what? That's how you kill churches. I don't mean kill churches. I mean the Holy Spirit leaves. And that place is dead. If we love one another, instead of being Romans chapter 2 people, we will go to them privately and say, it breaks my heart, and I hope I got this wrong. But is this true? And if it's not true, I will be your biggest advocate, friend. Very important. We do not have the authority to issue a final decision or judgment. That's up to God. And the Bible says that you are therefore condemning yourself, meaning that you are issuing a judgment against yourself when you issue or say such things. And so the conclusion is that whoever he's speaking of in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, it's the person that is baked into the cake, as it were, an act of condemning other people. And that's a very, very sad thing. Matthew chapter 7, you guys okay? Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, listen to this. Judge not, that's the word condemn. See, we see the word judge not and we say, you can't tell me, hey, it's none of your business what I'm doing over here, this, that, and the other. Oh, yes, it is. No, the Bible says judge not. No, the Bible says here, Matthew 7, 1, condemn not. We have no authority. It is not to us. Judge not or condemn not that you be not condemned. 
For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And you do, and why do you look at the speck, a speck like a grain of sand, you know, in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrites. <laughs> That's Jesus. He's so subtle. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is that graphic? Can you imagine this guy coming up, and he's got this two by four in his eye, and he's going, you got something wrong with you. <laughs> That's how God sees this. Right, we look really amazing on the outside. It's like, wow. And then God, but God, you, God's glasses, it's like, you know, like infrared vision. He puts his glasses on. You go, man, oh, plank sticking out of that guy's face. <laughs> and he's telling that guy that he's got a problem with his spec? What Jesus saying? He's saying that there's a difference about being personal with God versus religious with God. Amen. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets, and we'll throw in false teachers as well, right? Yes. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Amen. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? What's the answer to that? No. Do you get figs from thistles? No. Nope. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. It's very simple. It's very clear, very direct. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or proclaimed, preached? It doesn't mean tell the future. It means, didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we give messages? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders or miracles in your name? Wow. Don't you think if you saw that stuff happening, you'd think, wow, that person's going to be somebody in heaven. Right? Imagine if somebody, imagine if you saw somebody preaching, performing miracles, doing all these things. Wouldn't you in our psyche just kind of automatically say, wow. Jesus just blows that up. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken on him as a wise man who built his house on a rock. Is that powerful? It's so quiet in here because we're convicted. I call Jesus Lord. I prophesy, I preach. I'm not sure if I've ever cast the demon out of anybody. I don't think I've ever raised anybody. No, I'm pretty sure I have not raised anybody from the dead. <laughs> but you, you think of those things as assets. Can you imagine? Uh, you're, a, you're a pastor applying for a, a new job at a church. And, and what can you say about yourself? I, I've prophesied in Jesus' name. Uh, he is my Lord, Lord, Lord. Right? Uh, Raised a couple of dead people <laughs> and cast out some demons. And the person, if they're not thinking, they would say, oh, you're hired. But if they are thinking, they would say, let me get back to you. I'm going to pray a little longer on this. Why? Because that means nothing. Jesus is talking about a reality. Is it a reality that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life? Not some law, not some rules, not some church or religion or denomination. Matthew chapter 7, verse... Oh, we're done with that one. How about 2 Corinthians 13? 
2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 7. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 7 says there, uh, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. That's terrifying to think about. The legalist versus those who truly know God. I wrote down a little checklist here. Let's see if it works. It worked this morning, very early in the morning. Let's see if it works now. In my personal experience, the legalists are prolific hypocrites. I've watched them over the years. That's one, one thing great about being a Christian for decades upon decades is you begin to see things, and you see things fall into patterns. Um, and I wrote this down. I hope it doesn't offend you, but it's just in my head because I think Chuck Smith said it years ago. And So the legalist will say things like this. Um, they'll tell you not to uh, smoke, drink, or chew. Young people don't know what that means. That's chew tobacco. Don't smoke, drink, or do, or go out with girls who do. <laughs> and that was the rule. And they're very quick to point that out. And more. They will, listen, the legalists will lay burdens on you. I want you to think right now, any religion that says, now, for you to get better in your situation, you need to do these things. The moment that, are you listening, church? Yes. The moment anyone of religious standing says, for you to get better with us and God, you need to do these things. Here, let me, let me just give you a little thing here, and you just come back in a week when you're done. And we'll just make sure you get bumped up the God list. Um, they usually speak with very condemning words and with very judgmental criticisms. I can't believe you did that. What? It's not a good day when you share with a religious leader, a pastor, a priest, or a pope, and you say, well, you know what? I... I, I bit the cat. And they, and, and they go, you what? How could you? That's weird. Because Jesus said, and Paul says, those who don't, who don't know me, they do the same thing. So I've never done that. Did you think about it? The second thing I've observed in life is that you never feel loved by them you never feel secured after talking to them. You never feel uplifted or edified. You don't get instruction from them. You don't get correction. You don't get guiding. That leaves you desiring God more. When you meet with them, you desire God less. You put your head down. You walk away. Defeated. Jesus is never in that. Can you all hear me? He's not in it. Amen. He will speak to you and he will encourage you. And listen, no matter who you might be today, and if you've committed some horrible sin, you know what he's saying to you? He's saying to you right now, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, hand it to me. Even those who are addicted to something, you know what he's saying to you? Hand it to me. And you're saying, I don't, I can't, I can't. Give it to me. Just hand it, put it in my hand. And you're, you're terrified because you know that the withdrawal is going to be brutal. Let him mitigate the withdrawal. Let him take care of the withdrawal. Amen. Whatever it is, religion will say, how could you? Go away from me. Jesus says, give it to me. It's like he takes it because he takes the wound of it. Mm. Only he can do it. Listen, he's the only one qualified to reach out and say, give it to me. You want to know why? Because 2,000 years ago, he felt it at the cross. Mm. That's, that woman who was caught in the act of adultery, Jesus was going to feel it at the cross. Thank God, according to the book of Hebrews, he feels it no more. Did you know that? 
He died and suffered once, the Bible says, once. And so now, think of it. He's saying to you, are you addicted to that drink? Are you addicted to that drug? Are you addicted to that porn? Are you addicted to that violence? Are you addicted to fill in the blank? He's saying, just give it to me. Just give it to me. He's that good. The scripture here goes on and he announces to us that regarding you and I and his righteousness that you and I are to live in the light. He goes on in verse 1, for you who judge practice the same things. We don't need to belabor this. They are not walking in the light. The Bible is very clear about this. The word practice, look at it. In fact, it should be on the screen. Uh, The word practice means to attend to it. Those who practice these sins, they attend to it. Those who are not walking with God, they give their thoughts to it. To do what is not allowed or uh, to think about it when uh, you're not doing it. It's just a preoccupation with it. Being uh, that which excites or pulls along or draws you along. When it says that you, you say no to all this stuff, but in actuality, this thing is in your mind. You think about it all the time. And when you're not doing it, you're thinking about it. And when you're doing it, you're thinking about it again. It is consuming you. And Jesus is saying, Paul is saying, the Bible is saying, you need a new life. (laughs) Jesus said in John 8, 36, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus said that. Free. It's Amazing. So listen, I want to pick up the pace, we're running out of time, and I want to get you guys through this, at least this one verse. How's that? Wouldn't that be amazing? In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10, listen to this. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. The Bible says, don't be deceived, don't trick yourself. God's not mocked. Nothing gets pulled over his eyes. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Listen to this. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I'll come back to that in a second. And let us not grow weary uh, while doing good, for in due time, uh, in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are the household of faith, especially those who are um, in your vicinity, your brothers and sisters in Christ. When that verse there says, uh, so to the spirit, what does that mean? Uh, This is so liberating. This is so the sun setting you free. As a believer, if I choose to not do the things that I should do regarding strengthening my life for the day, whatever that is, I just... I just don't do it. I go into almost a state of neutral, and it's not good. Number two, if I'm a believer, and I do not invest in the things spiritually in my life, but in the flesh, and those things are sinful, I start out in a gross negative, right? I'm still a Christian, but it's tough going. Third, if I choose to walk in the Spirit, what can I expect? To walk in the Spirit is to, when he says, so do the things of the Spirit, it is to invest yourself in the things of God. It's very simple. We make it a big deal, but it's very simple. So we read a moment ago that those who practice those things but do them, or they do them, they practice them, and they say you shouldn't, this is, this is walking in the Spirit. I, watch, are you ready? Don't miss it. Do you have your attention? Yes. Here it is. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. Dear Lord, please don't let me become so polished as a Christian that I'm tempted to become almost professional at being a Christian, so routine, so ho-hum about it all, that there's no dynamic There's no thrill at being a Christian. I play it safe. 
God, don't let me play it safe. Don't let me sow to the flesh. Because if I let my Christianity grow dull, now, if that's growing dull, then the things of the world begin to sparkle. Ooh, did you see that? Ooh, did you see the other? So, Lord, please don't let me do that. Rather, Lord, I'm asking you to attend to my mind. I'm asking you to take the word that I just read a moment ago about this person who condemns others, but they themselves entertain such evils. Lord, don't let my mind go down that road. And so, Jesus, as I go now to live my day, I'm going to ask you, please, now, keep ever before me your presence. Let me keep me, make me walk in your light. Amen. And, and you, that's it. What I just showed you just now begins the day of walking in the spirit. And we can all do this. And I trust you do. When you and I do things that are not honoring to God, we are obviously not walking in the spirit. And to walk in the spirit is not some mystical glow. No, to walk in the spirit is to make a decision. I'm not going to condemn people. I'm not going to waste my time making that decision. It's ill, it's wrong, it's sin. Rather, I'm going to decide to walk with him. So who do I think I am? I'm a forgiven child of God, who is, in this world, still a sinner. Yet, the process of my final sanctification has not yet come. Oh, he's sanctifying you and I every day, is he not? Yes. He's working on us, and he's talking to us, and he's showing us. But the final sanctification, that final act, is the moment you and I transition out of this world and into the kingdom that we're longing for and desiring, his kingdom, Amen. his world, his government, his rule. Yeah. It's absolutely awesome to think. So the question is, is the kingdom in you? If the kingdom of Christ is in you, you can sit here and hear a message like this today and say, yep, yep, well, mm -hmm. If God's kingdom is awaking you, you can see and say to yourself, I need to get this taken care of. I need to take this to Christ. I need to be right with him. And that is so very liberating. Well, hey, thanks for listening. And uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age, us being together and linking up together to get the word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.